Hello and welcome to this short video brought to you by tutor to you This video is going to be looking at the AQA A-Level Specification for Psychology and in particular we are going to be recapping research methods and different types of validity. Let's begin by thinking about what this word validity actually means. So validity refers to whether a measure such as an observation or experiment produces a result that is legitimate. In other words, whether the observed effect is genuine and represents what is actually out there in the real world. This includes whether the researcher has managed to measure what it intended to measure, internal validity. It also refers to whether data can be generalized to other situations outside of the research environment that they were originally gathered in. This is external validity. Internal validity is a measure of whether results obtained are solely affected by changes in the variable being manipulated i.e. by the independent variable, in a cause and effect relationship. Two key types of internal validity are construct validity. This asks whether a measure successfully measures the concept it's supposed to. For example, does a questionnaire measure IQ or something related but crucially different? The other type of internal validity is concurrent validity. This asks whether a measure is in agreement with pre-existing measures that are validated to test for the same or a very similar concept, and this is gauged by correlated measures against each other. The internal validity of a study can be assessed based on whether extraneous, or in other words, unwanted variables that could also affect results are successfully controlled or eliminated. The greater the control of such variables, the greater the confidence that cause and effect relevant to the construct being investigated can be found. The other type of validity we're going to take a look at is external validity, and this is to do with outside of the experiment. So internal in the experiment, external outside. External validity is a measure of whether data can be generalised to other situations outside of the research environments they were originally gathered in. Two key types of external validity are ecological validity and temporal validity. Let's begin with ecological validity. Ecological validity is whether data is generalizable to the real world based on the conditions research is conducted under and procedures involved. For example, lab research can exert a high degree of control over extraneous variables that would otherwise vary in a natural environment. So results might be considered too artificial and thus possess low ecological validity. This is one of the easiest weaknesses to go for if you are asked about weaknesses of lab experiments. So although they've got high levels of control, they've also got high levels of artificialness and therefore they might not be ecologically valid, the findings that are produced. However, mice, for example, might behave in the same way in a lab and in the wild. So lab experiments could arguably still maintain high ecological validity here. I guess the lesson is it depends what participants you are using. The second type of external validity is temporal validity. Temporal validity is high when research findings successfully apply across time. Certain variables in the past may no longer be relevant now or in the future. An easy way to remember this one is temporal begins with a T and so does the word time. So temporal validity is all about time. For example, changes in attitudes towards gender roles over time could lower the temporal validity of data from past experiments when we try to apply them to modern day research. So let's recap. So far, we've looked at two different types of internal validity and also two different types of external validity. Now we're going to have a look at the assessment of validity. So how can we assess that a measure is accurate? Firstly, face validity. So face validity is quite simple. It's a measure of whether it looks subjectively promising that a tool measures what it's supposed to. For example, it might be observed that people with higher scores in exams are getting higher scores on an IQ questionnaire. You cannot be sure that these are directly linked, but on the surface it appears that exam scores are a reasonable indication of IQ scores, so your measure here shows good face validity. A second way we can assess levels of validity is one that we've already spoken about before, concurrent validity. This asks whether a measure is in agreement with pre-existing measures that are validated to test for the same or a very similar concept. And this is gauged by correlated measures against each other 
and is indicated if the correlation between the two sets of scores exceeds plus 0 0.80 in a correlation coefficient. To finish this video, we're going to consider another common exam question, which is all around improving the validity of a certain study. Now, how we improve the validity of a study depends on what research method is being used. The first one we are going to look at is experiments and how we can improve the validity of an experiment. The first thing you could do is use a control group. Researchers better able to assess whether changes in the DV were just down to the independent variable when you use a control group. So a control group is a group that doesn't face the change. It doesn't face that manipulation. You could standardise your procedures. This minimises the impact of participant reactivity and investigator effects on the validity of the outcomes. You could carry out a single blind study. A single blind study is when participants are not made aware of the aims until after the study has taken place. In turn, this reduces demand characteristics and makes the participants' behaviour more authentic. Finally, you could carry out a double-blind study. This is where the researcher or the person being researched, the participant, doesn't know the aim of the study. And instead, a third party conducts the investigation without knowing its main purpose. This reduces both demand characteristics and investigator effects. If you are asked in the exam about improving the validity of a questionnaire, well, many questionnaires and psychological tests incorporate something called a lie scale within the questions in order to assess the consistency of a respondent's response and to control the effects of social desirability bias. In other words, to stop the participant choosing answers that they think makes them look better. So how a lie scale works is basically asking the respondents about the same thing the same topic, the same question, just worded differently to see whether their responses are consistent, whether they have the same view consistently or whether they change their responses based on the question being asked. So a lie scale is asking the same question in multiple different ways to check for the consistency of a response. You could also assure your respondents that all data given will be anonymous and this increases the validity by encouraging participants to answer more truthfully. If they know that their data is not going to be told to the world and their name is going to be given next to that or details which could identify that person, it's likely they're going to be more honest and more truthful. And finally, if you were asked about improving the validity of an observation, well, observations which have little intervention from a researcher are more likely to have higher ecological validity. In this way, Covert observation would improve validity as opposed to overt observation, as it means the behaviour of those observed is more likely to be more natural and authentic. So this is a good way to go here if you are given a STEM, which talks about an overt observation that a research carried out. And the question is, how could you improve the validity of this research study? You might want to say, use a covert observation instead. Remember, covert observation is all about going undercover. The participants don't know they're being observed. And as a result, they're probably less likely going to change their behaviour. Think about a classroom observation with your teacher. If your teacher knows that they are going to be observed, how do they behave? However, if you, as one of the students, were secretly observing your teacher, they're probably going to act more naturally because they're not aware that they are being observed. But I wouldn't recommend doing that. In addition, if behavioural categories are too broad, overlapping or ambiguous, they may have a negative impact on the validity of the data collected. Remember, behavioural categories is all about breaking down that target behaviour that you want to view into measurable constructs. So rather than looking at social anxiety, which isn't really measurable, you might want to break that down into things which are measurable. So how many times a person avoids a particular social situation, for example. Now, if these behavioural categories aren't too broad, they're not overlapping, they're not ambiguous. This means when we look at inter-observer reliability, we can be consistent with our findings, which then could lead to the increase of the validity of the data. It's likely to be more accurate. Thank you for watching this AQA A-Level Psychology video brought to you by Tutor2U which focused on research methods and the different types of validity.